Durante miles de años, las civilizaciones se han aferrado al prospecto de inmortalidad. Cada una a su propia manera. Ninguna ha dejado su huella tan notoriamente como una de las primeras, el Egipto Antiguo. Hace 5.000 años, los egipcios enfocaron su genio singular a la búsqueda de la vida después de la muerte, dejando un legado de misterios que siguen aún sin resolverse. Pero en el desierto, pistas sorprendentes nos enfrentan por primera vez con los constructores de las pirámides. En laboratorios distantes, los científicos hacen grandes esfuerzos para comprender la manera de morir de los egipcios. Como nunca antes, la ciencia moderna trae nueva vida a los secretos de los faraones. Los secretos de los faraones. Hace 45 siglos, una de las hazañas más extraordinarias de la historia humana tuvo lugar en el desierto egipcio. Las tres tumbas reales de los faraones con más de 6 millones de bloques de piedras tardaron 70 años en ser construidas. Sin tecnología moderna, obreros levantaron bloques que pesaban dos toneladas y media cada uno y los colocaron a una velocidad de uno cada dos minutos. La imposibilidad aparente de la tarea ha llevado a especular que los egipcios poseían conocimientos místicos perdidos hace mucho, o que fueron ayudados por extraterrestres. Pero la meseta de arena de Giza está añadiendo nuevas pistas sobre el misterio de las pirámides y sobre el cómo. 200 years of digging have produced pyramids, tombs, temples, statues, nice inscriptions and relief scenes, but where were all the people? Mark Lenner es profesor de arqueología egipcia en el Instituto Oriental de la Universidad de Chicago. Su trabajo ha ayudado a cambiar el centro de estudio de monumentos a gente. For the first time we're excavating to shed some light on the lives of the people as opposed to just how the elite and the king that they served, how they were buried. Descubrimientos de Lenner y otros han hecho pensar en cómo fueron construidas las pirámides. Por siglos se creyó que los constructores habían sido esclavos. Hollywood alimentó el mito de esclavos trabajando bajo los azotes del látigo. Pero un día, en 1990, un descubrimiento notorio cambió ese mito para siempre. Una nueva era en los estudios sobre los egipcios inició con un turista cabalgando. Una herradura cayó en el techo de una tumba que se selló en el tiempo de los faraones. Dentro había un vistazo a la eternidad. La bóveda estaba cubierta de yeso colorido que se desintegró en el momento de ser expuesta al aire del desierto. Pero por poco tiempo brilló como la tumba de un rey. El hombre enterrado aquí no era un rey o un noble. Solo era un obrero. De acuerdo al doctor Sahih Hawass, director general de la meseta de Giza, 
El diseño y construcción de esta tumba sugiere que el hombre dentro no era un esclavo. En los meses que siguieron al hallazgo de la bóveda, el doctor Hawass desenterró más de 250 tumbas adicionales en la misma área. Habían encontrado un cementerio para trabajadores. La bóveda del capataz está rodeada de las tumbas de su personal. Como las tumbas de los faraones y los nobles, las tumbas de los obreros estaban acomodadas de acuerdo a sus estatus. El doctor Jaguás descubrió que algunas tumbas tenían jeroglíficos, otra prueba de que los constructores de Giza eran buenos artesanos. We found here three false doors. Above each one, we found painted stila. We found in the titles of those people the hieroglyphic inscriptions saying that Kherb Yerius means director of building tombs, and Sahaj Yerius means inspector of building tombs. Okay. Durante la excavación, los arqueólogos hallaron algo más que confirmó el estatus del trabajador. Como los reyes, los constructores quisieron tener obras de arte que los acompañaran en la eternidad. Grabados detallados, jeroglíficos y pequeñas estatuas nos dan pistas de cómo se veían los antiguos trabajadores. Hawass y su equipo comenzaron a ver una imagen vívida de los constructores, pero nada los preparó para lo que encontrarían. Finalmente, en la sombra de las pirámides, los trabajadores se encuentran con sus antiguos predecesores. El estudio forense revela una historia de sufrimiento y sacrificio. De un trabajo tan arduo que literalmente los terminaba. En el estudio de los bones que encontramos, la mayoría de los hombres que han sido encontrados en el cementerio tenían estrés en su back. On the bones of the back, mean that those people were involved in really moving stones, or working in the pyramids, or working in the tombs. Archaeology now is not like uh, what you see in King Tut and find gold and gold in King Tut never give us any idea about the people and about how they lived and about anything. But this cemetery is working with the dirt and the sand. Then each piece of sand, each piece of stone, each piece of pottery reconstructs the Egyptian history. It gives us information about those people. 
Hoy la vida en la meseta de Giza aún se mueve al ritmo antiguo del desierto. Los egipcios trabajan aquí ahora, revelando lentamente las vidas de sus ancestros. Solo un puñado de hombres llega a trabajar hoy. Pero durante la construcción de las pirámides había miles. Mark Lenner sabía que una mano de obra así necesitaba una ciudad que la mantuviera. Pero ¿dónde estaba la evidencia de esta ciudad abandonada? La primera pista apareció cuando los excavadores descubrieron una panadería. It's as though everywhere we open up a hole in the desert, we find massive evidence of bread baking. And we're talking about thousands and thousands and thousands of loaves. Where you have so much bread, the beer can't be far away, and where you have bread and beer, you have to have people. So it says that there are a lot of consumers out here. Lenner y su equipo hallaron recipientes para batir y cientos de moldes de pan. We apologize to this pot that's been here for 5,000 years, intact. But there's no way we can take it out. Oh. Mientras más descubren los arqueólogos, más reconocible se vuelve la panadería. Han visto su marca antes. Durante años, los egiptólogos han confiado en la tumba de Ti, cerca de Saqqara, para saber sobre detalles de la vida diaria en el tiempo de los faraones. Los murales muestran una amplia gama de actividades. Las ilustraciones muestran cómo preparaban la cerveza y cómo horneaban pan en una línea de producción con lo que alimentaban a miles. Coincidía exactamente con la panadería de Lenner. The beautiful thing about our results here is that the tomb walls inform what we're finding. You can go to this almost like a Sears catalog, like I say, and say, oh yeah, this is what we've got. It's a nice kind of uh, merger of text, picture, and uh, archaeological remains. Pieza por pieza, los arqueólogos van reuniendo el trazado del antiguo lugar de construcción. El desierto esconde la mayoría de la evidencia, pero algunas pistas están al descubierto, esperando a que encuentren su verdadero significado. Por años, el doctor Lenner transitó por este pasaje a diario sin darle mucha importancia. Cuando las excavaciones revelaron que las estructuras estaban enterradas en la arena, Lenner reconsideró su importancia. Lo que parecía ser una saliente de 360 metros era un muro gigantesco que una vez se alzó 9 metros sobre el desierto. Now you don't build a 26-foot high gateway so men can go to work every day. This is a border, and this is the entrance to something really powerful. And what's really powerful are the pyramids, the tombs, and the temples, the tombs of the elite. 
And we think that the wall defines a border between all of that, the sacred, the stone, and everything here to the south, which is mud, uh, stone rubble, and the secular support for everything north of the wall. And more and more I'm convinced this was in fact downtown Egypt during the time the pyramids were built. Lehner cree que podrían encontrar un gran palacio, incluso una residencia real en el lado céntrico del muro. En el enorme pórtico hay una bahía, el centro de actividad de toda la meseta. In a harbor they're certainly unloading the stone, they're unloading the people that they're bringing from the provinces for labor, but they're also unloading all the goods and commodities that came from all those new farms and ranches and cities, towns that were established for feeding the pyramid complex. For the first time they were gathering people together not in terms of hundreds, but suddenly in terms of thousands or tens of thousands. En la orilla del desierto, esta gente venía a construir tumbas para sus reyes, rascacielos que empequeñecerían cualquier otra construcción humana. Las técnicas de construcción eran ingeniosas, pero misteriosas hasta el día de hoy. ¿Cómo levantaron esas enormes piedras más de 40 pisos? Muchos estudiosos creen que usaron una gran rampa que subía en espiral alrededor de la pirámide para subir los bloques. We would have seen hundreds if not thousands of men organized probably into teams of 10 or 20 pulling two and a half ton blocks on large wooden sleds up the long ramp. There would have been a cacophony of sounds. You would have heard the clink a chink of stonemasons cutting the stones, tool sharpeners sharpening the copper chisels, and probably the chanting of thousands of men They had to be doing this in a real rhythm if they put one block in place every two and a half minutes. Aun cuando surge una imagen de la antigua construcción, queda otro importante misterio. ¿De dónde salieron 15 millones de toneladas de piedra caliza? Durante siglos, un mito popular sostenía que la piedra venía de una cantera lejana, pero el doctor Lenner creía que tenía que haber una fuente mucho más cercana. Para asegurarse, buscó una cantera moderna, donde la piedra es cortada como se hacía en el 2500 antes de Cristo. Los canteros cavaban primero largos canales para sacar grandes bloques de piedra. De encontrarse marcas como esta cerca de la pirámide, localizarían una fuente más cercana de piedras. En Giza, a solo 300 metros de la base de la pirámide más grande, Lenner encontró lo que estaba buscando, las marcas en forma de canal. Person. You can actually see the, the, uh, the quarry man's pick mark in, in vertical striations coming down. And he was in here probably alone with lots of dust and chips flying all over the place with his pick, hacking his way through this giant rectangle of limestone bedrock. Por fin, el doctor Lenner tenía una prueba. La piedra venía de aquí mismo, de una cantera cercana de las grandes pirámides. And you can see one edge of the quarry over there, the rock uh, edge, just showing above these massive piles of debris. And if you draw a circle with your eye around the horizon and come over to this sheer rock face, that's the entire outline of the Khufu quarry. The amount of stone missing equals the amount of stone in the pyramid of Khufu, and the sides of the quarry line up with the Khufu pyramid. Por generaciones, no se supo de la cantera porque estaba cubierta de escombros. Lenner cree que estos escombros es lo que queda de las rampas para la construcción. Al terminar, los constructores deshacían las rampas y las dejaban aquí, en la cantera. 
We're looking at what the pyramid ramps were built out of, just piles and piles of this limestone dust. And then they put up a retaining wall of mud and clay. And this stuff as a whole, you know, is extremely solid. But when you want to take it apart, it really comes apart nicely with a pick and into its constituent parts. So this is essentially what the pyramid ramps must have been built out of because this is what's here. Tons, millions of tons of this stuff. Aun cuando resolvemos los misterios de cómo se construyeron las tumbas de los tres faraones, los científicos y la gente están asombrados del alcance de esta antigua tarea. Los descubrimientos de Lenner sirven para descartar algunas de las teorías más descabelladas. Es para mí mucho más misterioso y intrigante que la cultura ruled by Khufu, Khafre, and Menkare built these rather than some cop-out, you know, which is what, you know, the extraterrestrial option is. It's a cop-out. Well, we don't know how they did it. It was built by somebody else. Um, first of all, it's sort of colonialist to say that somebody else, some other civilization that's missing, built them. But also, I think it really, it really doesn't tap the human mystery of how they were built with so much suffering, with so much dedication, Um, by the people that we know lived here, by the people in the tombs that were buried around here, by the people who were making bread down in our bakery. Al erigirse la gran pirámide de Jufu en el desierto, casi terminada, varios de los mejores artesanos de Egipto fueron a trabajar en otro regalo para el faraón. Durante miles de años, los peregrinos venían a ver los logros de los constructores de las pirámides sin saber que habían tesoros enterrados bajo sus pies. En 1954, se descubrió una bóveda subterránea bajo estas piedras, cerca de la base sur de la pirámide. En la bóveda, exploradores encontraron los restos de un bote, un bote muy grande. Farouk el Bas recuerda el revuelo que el hallazgo causó. The news of the day said that we had found the ship uh, that's kind of a funerary boat when they removed the pharaoh westward sailing westward with the uh, with the, the with the sun so that he'd be buried in this place and a lot of people expected aha now they're going to find his body the mummy because the uh, Khufu's mummy had never been found Tuhami Mahmoud Ali era supervisor de la gente a cargo de la excavación اول حجر وكان شعورك كيف ساعتها كنت فرحان عشان وجدنا مركب مش في العالم I was delighted because we had found a uh, ship and the likes of which didn't exist anywhere in the world. Tuhami fue de los primeros en entrar a la bóveda en casi 50 siglos. Pero en vez de la momia del faraón, encontraron un bote desarmado por completo. 1224 piezas de cedro pulido, acomodados. En palabra de un observador, como partes de un modelo de juguete. Tomó 13 años de minucioso trabajo volver a armar el bote. Las antiguas técnicas de armado, como unir las tablas a los rieles, se siguieron cuidadosamente. Para los historiadores, el bote es una proeza de ingeniería, tan impresionante como las mismas pirámides. Cuando la nave iba tomando forma, los expertos disentían respecto a cómo se había usado originalmente. Para algunos solo era una barca funeraria, otros creían que era la nave del faraón para su otra vida. Jeroglíficos de la pirámide cercana de Unas sugieren que un faraón debía partir en dos botes, uno durante el día y otro en la noche, siguiendo el sol hasta la eternidad. Otros relieves, como estos en las paredes de la tumba de Ti, son evidencia documental de la importancia del cruce del bote en el río Nilo, pero son de poca ayuda para seguir el debate. Solo nos muestran cómo se hacían los antiguos botes.
cualquiera que haya sido su uso, la nave de 43 metros debió impresionar tanto entonces como el día de hoy. Es uno de los barcos más antiguos del mundo. Albergado en su propio museo, el bote Jufu atrae a 200.000 visitantes al año. Cedar Wood. 34 años después, los científicos examinaban el contenido de una segunda cámara subterránea, descubierta a unos pasos de la primera. Pero esta vez no la excavarían. El doctor Elvas, director del Centro Universitario de Boston para la Detección a Distancia y científicos patrocinados por National Geographic, Empezaron la operación con un radar introducido en la Tierra que proveería un mapa de figuras bajo la superficie. Esta aproximación de la era espacial resolvió uno de los problemas más difíciles de la arqueología, cómo explorar un lugar sin destruirlo. No cabarían, solo removerían un tramo de tierra suelta de una de las enormes rocas que cubrían la fosa. So archaeology is no longer a uh, grave, a grave uh, robbing uh, activity or uh, a uh, destruction, a way of destroying things until you get the artifacts. It's no longer because the, the site itself might be an artifact to keep it intact the way the ancients had left it. So this is really getting a, 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 a way of departing from the, uh, the archaeology the way it was. And we are just opening a whole new way that might apply in, in many other fields. <laughs> El plan era hacer un pequeño orificio en la tapa de seis pies de ancho de la bóveda y mantenerla hermética. Cuando se abrió la primera cámara en 1954, el aire dentro era aún denso, con el olor a cedro. Era posible que el aire en esta bóveda hubiera estado atrapado por más de 46 siglos. Un inestimable hallazgo científico. Bob Morse, de Black and Decker, desarrolló un sofisticado aparato que sirve para que el aire nuevo y el viejo no se mezclen. Un sistema de anillos y sellos de seguridad se sujetaría a la roca. La barrena atravesaría la piedra a una velocidad de 4 pulgadas por hora, con pausas frecuentes para remover polvo y restos. El diseño de Moore permitiría que el hoyo permaneciera hermético cuando se introdujeran otros instrumentos. En la bóveda se recogerían muestras de aire y se buscarían contaminantes de aire reciente. No encontrarlos explicaría por qué el bote estaba bien conservado. Peter Tanz, de la Administración Oceánica y Atmosférica, supervisaría los procedimientos de las muestras. The boat in the adjacent pit to this one <coughs> uh, was extremely well preserved for 4600 years and from what I've heard it has deteriorated more in the past 20 years than in the previous 4600. So the Egyptians are not very keen on opening this pit and getting the boat out or if there's a boat in there of course and then have it crumble. So they would uh, like to see what's in there what is like in there and then seal the hole back up. La operación de la barrena tardó un día entero. Después uno más. Y a mitad del tercer día, la barrena de Bob Moore penetraba los últimos milímetros de piedra.
Es el turno del resto del grupo para trabajar. Peter Tanz saca casi 70 litros de aire de la bóveda. Como los resultados de los análisis se conocerán en meses, Tanz decide hacer una prueba menos científica ahí mismo. Es casi medianoche y es el turno de los fotógrafos. El largo tubo negro es parte de un sistema de video especial diseñado por Pete Petron de National Geographic. Para no afectar la temperatura dentro de la bóveda, una lámpara sin calor provee la luz. Mientras la cámara desciende lentamente por el orificio, todos se acercan a un monitor para ser los primeros en ver cosas que no se habían visto durante casi 5.000 años. Una extraña lluvia de polvo muestra la entrada de la cámara al espacio que ha esperado tanto tiempo en la oscuridad. Tujami no tiene duda de que lo que ve son las piezas de un segundo bote. La cámara muestra una viga cortada que sujetaba el techo de una cubierta, una gran pista para el tamaño del bote. Otros ángulos revelan accesorios de cobre cálculos antiguos de los canteros. Los expertos creen que las piezas son parte de un bote muy parecido al primero, aunque quizá más pequeño. El claro daño a la bóveda podría deberse a una máquina usada para construir el museo para el primer bote. Estaba justo encima de esta segunda cámara, vibrando y escurriendo agua. Otros detalles parecen confirmar esta hipótesis. Partes del techo húmedo de donde el yeso se desprendió. Un par de remos fantasmales deformados por la humedad. Y luego, algo inesperado. ¿Qué That's what we tried to do. We tried to find out. And we did find out there's something living down there. After taking samples of the air and after looking at it, 
we know that we have not disturbed the site at all. So this is kind of a starting a whole new, uh, opening a whole new door to uh, technology. And I personally believe that this might uh, be a, a, a new change to the archaeological exploration, very much like what uh, age dating did to archaeology earlier in this century. El poder calcular fechas ayudó a que la arqueología se convirtiera en una ciencia más exacta. La exploración con video promete expandir su alcance a terrenos que parecían impenetrables hasta ahora. Con un bote restaurado, el otro se mantiene seguro en su lugar de reposo, ahora sellado. El propósito de estos dos botes sigue siendo un misterio. ¿Servirían para transportar al faraón en vida por el Nilo? ¿O para llevar su cuerpo y alma reunidos a la otra vida en la incesante búsqueda del sol? Ese eterno viaje requería de un cuerpo bien preservado. Y algunos cuerpos de los faraones aún están aquí, testigos silenciosos de las habilidades y dedicación de los antiguos embalsamadores. El arte de los momificadores, alguna vez curiosidad de museo, se convirtió en la obsesión del egiptólogo Bob Breyer. I tend not to say I'm obsessed with mummies. I know other people do, but I'm interested in all aspects. I have been really, I guess I have been obsessed. I admit it, I admit it, I'm obsessed. La obsesión del Dr. Breyer lo llevó a donde ningún científico había estado antes. Después de agotar los textos de momificación, se dio cuenta que no podría entender el procedimiento hasta que él mismo practicara una. Así que un cuerpo donado recibiría el tratamiento de un rey antiguo. I'm not a mortician. I'm a professor and I've been teaching Egyptology for more than 20 years. When the University of Maryland Medical School offered to collaborate with me, I had the chance to do the first Egyptian mummification in perhaps 2000 years. But it's not going to be easy. We're just amateurs compared with the ancient embalmers. They were so skilled, they could remove the brain through the nostrils without damaging the face. Right there. And let me just get the block and I'm just going to tap it. I want to tap it through. Okay, go ahead. All right? Yeah. It is in, my friend. I became interested in mummification, watching a colleague of mine do a dissection. But I wondered, as I watched this guy dissect the body, how the ancient embalmers did it. He had, a, my colleague, had a large flap in the abdomen to show the students the internal organs. But the ancient Egyptians took out the internal organs through an incision this big. And I wondered, would he be able to do it? Could he reach his hand in and pull out the stomach, the liver, the intestines, the kidney, through an incision this big? Give it a go. And it may just not be sharp enough. Ron Way, de la Universidad de Maryland, compartió su experiencia anatómica para los extraordinarios procedimientos. This is the only way to find out. And then you cut with the front. That's what it is. Yeah. No. Good. Nice. Para prepararse para la momificación, Breyer pasó semanas en Egipto aprendiendo todo sobre ritos antiguos y yendo a los mercados antiguos por las especias sagradas y los materiales que su momia necesitaría. Deep within Cairo's Khan al-Khalili Bazaar, there's another market where tourists never go. That's where they have the frankincense, the myrrh, all the things I need for my project. The frankincense I know from an ancient Egyptian text goes on the head of a mummy. They used to anoint the mummy with frankincense. The myrrh, all I know is they used it, but I don't know exactly what they used the myrrh for yet. But I'm going to try to find out before the mummification. 
Eda, la ben. Pekam ruba kilo. Ruba kilo this frankincense and myrrh probably came from the same place that the ancient Egyptians got theirs from. It comes from Yemen, it comes from the Sudan. It would have been very expensive, and only the bombers could afford it for wealthy mummies. No one knows how many mummies there are in Egypt, but people were dying for a long time. So there are certainly millions of bodies in the sand and in the earth. Mummification probably began by just discovering that when bodies are buried in the hot Egyptian sand, they're preserved naturally. The, the soil just dehydrates them naturally. So eventually, if the sand would blow away from a body, you would see a recognizable human being that's been there for maybe a thousand years. So they realized that the body could be preserved and was preserved. These bodies here in this cemetery in the Fayum are middle class to lower class. They, of course, haven't excavated the entire area yet, but they'll probably find, if they kept going, close to 200,000 bodies. Everyone in ancient Egypt, rich or poor, wanted to be immortal, to be like Osiris, to resurrect in the West. So everybody had a shot at immortality, and the more you could afford, the better your shot at immortality, the better preserve the body, because the body was going to get up and go again in the next world. It was literally going to resurrect, so you had to preserve it. So all your money, all your thought went into preserving your body. The poor man couldn't put too much money into it. He was merely wrapped, placed perhaps even in a, in a mass pit burial, and would just hope for the best. La búsqueda de Breyer lo llevó al Museo del Cairo que tiene más momias que las que se han contado. Ahí están las cosas que los faraones llevaban en su muerte. The Egyptians didn't just preserve their bodies. They wanted to have backup systems. They didn't want to have just one shot at immortality. So they had large guardian statues to guard their coffins and small servant statues, which would come to life and serve them in the next world. To make the actual trip, they built elaborate coffins painted with an idealized image of the person and covered them with magical spells to protect the body from harm. Often when people look at these cases and the wrappings, they see the beautiful paintings. They see the gods and the hieroglyphs, but they don't realize there's a human being inside, still looking pretty much like he did 3,000 years ago. The great thing about mummies, and what I think draws people to them, is that they're recognizable. You see somebody who was once a pharaoh, a king of Egypt who died three, four thousand years ago. But if you knew him, you would say, ah, there's Seti, there's Ramses. He's still recognizable. He may weigh a lot less, maybe 28 pounds is the average weight of a mummy after it's dehydrated. But you would still recognize him not only as a person, but as who he was. Most people don't know these pharaohs by name. But imagine what it would be like coming face to face with Julius Caesar, Alexander the Great. Helen of Troy. And this case contains one of the greatest kings that Egypt ever knew. Just the primary tests. 
for this. Uh, Nasri Iskander is the keeper of mummies in the Egyptian uh, Museum. To see if He's been doing it for 20 is, years and is one of the foremost authorities on mummies, certainly on the Egyptian collection. And they seem not. So, so everything so looks nothing, good. Nothing is unusual. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Oh, it looks wonderful. The Pharaoh Ramses the Great reigned for 67 years. He was more than 80 when he died over 3,000 years ago. This is the kind of mummification I want to do. The Ramses mummy shows us just how good the Egyptian embalmers were. His hair was dyed henna. His fingernails were painted. Everything was done for him so that he would look young forever. When I see this, I, I, I feel something inside. Uh -huh. I, I can't explain it, but I just feel it. Yes. And I think that most of the people will feel this. Yes. And yes. Th this is not just a, a, a dead body. No, it's a history. Mm -hmm big history. This man built Egypt. La búsqueda de Breyer lo llevó a la orilla oeste del Nilo, la tierra de los muertos, donde están los templos de los faraones. What's remarkable is that after 3,000 years, we have not only the temples of stone, but also the flesh and bones of the men who built them. The mummies of the pharaohs may have been impervious to time, but they were still vulnerable to one thing, looters. It's really a miracle that we have the ones we do. Many of the pharaohs that survived intact were found in a secret cache at Deir al-Bahri. It's isolated and desolate today, as it's always been, which is probably why the royal mummies weren't discovered until about a hundred years ago. It's a good thing they were. They're some of the best examples of the work of the master embalmers. Definitely something for me to strive for. Sometime in the late 1870s, local villagers stumbled upon this hidden cache of royal mummies. The miracle is that they even found this place. The hole was undoubtedly filled in. They probably noticed water running over the cliffs and disappearing into it, and they figured this must be a tomb. Word was sent to the antiquity service in Cairo that a tomb had been found, not containing one mummy or two, but 40. When the inscriptions on the coffins and bandages were read, they knew they had found the pharaohs of Egypt. They knew they had found Ramses the Great, Seti the First, the great warrior king, Tutmosis III. They knew what they had. They had found some of the greatest kings of ancient Egypt. In six days, they took the coffins out of this hole and they brought them across to the west bank of the Nile, where they were ferried across to the east to the antiquity services steamer, and then they went north to Cairo. All along the banks of the Nile, the women of the villages lined the banks and wailed like the ancient Egyptian women must have wailed. These were their kings leaving, and they were also wailing for a legacy that was going to Cairo, never to be seen again by them. Pero sus antiguos reyes inspirarían una nueva reverencia obligando a expertos como Breyer a rastrear cada detalle de su último viaje ritual. When a king died, he was ferried across to the west bank of the Nile where the embalmer shops were. The Egyptians lived on the east bank, and those who could afford it buried their dead on the west. The sun dies in the west, so they associated the west with death, and they called the people who died westerners. They didn't want to call them dead, so they had lots of euphemisms. They called them westerners. If you died, you went west. Textos antiguos nos dicen que la embalsamación tomaba 70 días. The first thing they did was to take out the moist internal organs. This is to help prevent decay. If you don't remove all the moisture, the body will rapidly deteriorate. Embalmers were really technicians. They were the ones who knew the anatomy, knew where the liver was, knew where the stomach was, and could take it out through a small slit. It was different. Okay, Bill, do you have a tray? Each organ was carefully removed and ritually placed in a special vessel called a canopic jar. Well, the ancient texts say that they washed out the abdominal cavity with myrrh and palm wine. So we're just going to do it the way they said they did it. So we've got a linen 
covering inside the abdominal cavity already. And I'm going to put the myrrh right on the linen. But this is the palm wine. Here it goes. The ancient Egyptian word for wine was erp, like a burp. La siguiente fase de momificación, deshidratar el cuerpo, se necesitarían sales de Egipto. In the ancient days, they called it the field of salts here, the Wadi Natrun. Natrun is much better than just salt for preserving something. It's got an extra thing in it. It's got basically baking soda. And you know how you put, um, when you put baking soda in your refrigerator to absorb the smells? This must have helped in mummification. It not only preserved, but it got rid of some of the horrible odor that must have been involved with mummification. Necesitará mucho natrón, unos 140 kilogramos para estar seguro. The mummy has to be totally immersed in it. So I'm going to have to have natrón under it. I want to put natrón on top of it, then fill the inside of the mummy with little packets of it, so that the mummy will dehydrate from inside and outside at the same time. Even Tutankhamun had some of these little packets that were buried in his embalmer's cache. All right, Ron, we'll do it down here. Okay, I'm going to pour it right here. Okay. Mm -hmm. There it goes. Yeah, you just smooth it in out. In a small basement room at the University of Maryland Medical School, we've recreated the ancient embalmer's tent, now, keeping the humidity to low to be like the dry desert air. Okay. We're just about there. Do you think we can get about six or seven more jars out of that? No problem. All right, Ron, here's the liver. If you can put it on the far corner, and we'll cover it a little later with a little more natron. Now we have to wait 35 days to see if the mummification actually takes place. We don't know for sure if the dehydration will be complete. We don't know if the natron will do its job. Whatever the outcome, this has been an important scientific venture. But there's something else about doing this. Almost defying death, preserving some measure of that human being as he was in life. I wonder, did the ancient embalmers feel any of this? Did they feel pride, hope, fear? I think it'll work, but I really don't know for sure. Wow. Feet look good, don't they? That's really desiccated. That is good. It's good. Now, take your brush. Let's, let's see where we go. Uh, here's the fingers. You know, it looks more like a mummy than I thought it would, because I thought there'd be more moisture. I think we're doing it the way they did it. I I'll never be 100% sure, but I'm I think this is the way they did it. Break this. Of course, I'm grateful to the body donor. It's still a wonderful thing for anyone to give his body to science, and I'm hoping that he would enjoy knowing that this is happening. I don't know for sure, though, but I like to think that he would like it. Finally, we want to finish the process, just as they were, by anointing the body with oils, then wrapping it in fine linen. If you were wealthy enough, you'd have a priest who's wearing a mask of the jackal-headed Anubis, god of embalming. The priest would say certain rituals over the body as it was being wrapped. Okay, they would good. pour unguents on the body. Frankincense and myrrh would be nice used to tiny. perfume it. This is good. Yeah. Okay, now, 
one of the funerary amulets used for the deceased was a heart amulet to protect the heart. The only organ inside him now is the heart, and this will protect the heart and make sure the heart doesn't speak out against him in the next world. Okay. Let's get one of the magical bandages, and then when it comes out, I think you'll see there's an inscription on it. This has, this right here is the weighing of the heart against the feather of truth in the next world. So it's an appropriate bandage for this area. The magical spells on the bandages aren't really part of my research. I'm interested in the technique of mummification. People just felt we should do it right, do the magical spells too, so we've done that. Uh, and they're, they're accurate. These are, these are what the papyri say should be on it. But the hope is it'll be in a medical museum. Periodically, we're going to have to sample tissues to see what, what age does to it, how the dehydration continues. So it'll be monitored carefully, and uh, hopefully people will learn from it. It looks good. We just have to seal the ends. Seal the ends. I think the care that we're giving to this mummy and the whole mummification process is certainly better than what the average mummy got. There have been no shortcuts for this man, which is good. He deserves it. At the tomb, the last rituals were performed on the mummy. There was the opening of the mouth ceremony, where a priest would take an adze, an oddly shaped implement, touch it to the mummy's mouth, and say a final blessing to give the mummy new life. La contribución de esta momia a la ciencia apenas comienza. Continuará informándonos de los procesos de momificación en los siguientes años y décadas. Solo podemos imaginar lo que sus antiguos homólogos dirían de nuestra fascinación por ellos. ¿Nos maldecirían por nuestras intromisiones, como se ha dicho? Quizá. Pero si lo que los egipcios buscaban era la inmortalidad, sin lugar a dudas, como nadie más en la historia, encontraron la inmortalidad en el reino de nuestra insaciable curiosidad.